try and use this as an opportunity to kind of sum up as well. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to take this kind of fast so that we have time for discussion because I don't know. I think there's been um, there's there's a lot to discuss after today's session. It's been excellent, and a big shout out to everyone who's been speaking because it's it's been great. Um, so I'm also going to think about from what. <sighs> Can we now picture what a heterarchy may look like? Is that possible? Should we be thinking about that? I have a very visual brain. Um, is that emerged from today? I'm not sure yet. But anyway, my starting point is examining the craft traditions of the Southern Scottish Iron Age. And it follows on really neatly from what Paul was just talking about, actually. Um, the kind of dynamic shifts um, of crafting and the, the power of having to assemble craft networks and the power of that and how that creates social structures and how that assembles into society. This image is a kind of, this shows the dynamic craft traditions in um, just East Lothian and I'm trying to do a sort of time lapse of how that emerges and, and re-emerges. I'll just play it again. Oh, jumping ahead. Um, uh, this was part of my doctorate research and I'm going back to re-examine the data to build up a very, a much more detailed picture of craft know-how over time as much as I can, as much as the evidence will allow. Um, so this goes from ubiquitous alienable worked bone to more inalienable um, localised copper alloy production. That's the orange and yellow which will appear. Yeah. Um, and this kind of dynamic shifting of different craft traditions over time, I think, supports a hierarchical model as proposed by Giles and Ehrenreich, um, where some craft skills were passed down through very controlled hierarchies. Um, for example, like copper alloy working or even pottery manufacture, I would argue for the area because it is, they're the blue circles. It's very site specific, um, very localized, even though it's cruddy crap pottery we have. It's, it's very um, locally produced. Um, whereas on the other hand, uh, more inalienable, alien, inalienable sorry, craft know-how, um, such as uh, uh, metallurgy, um, sorry, smelting, I've lost my space already. Um, so anyway, this just re represents dynamic shifts. Um, for example, work bone, that was a liberal network of know-how. Um, that's the big red splodges. Um, that was quite ubiquitous. Um, it wasn't as controlled. So um, this shows that society was able to preserve diverse forms of knowledge, making it perhaps, I would argue, a more resilient society that was not dependent on a limited palette of inalienable knowledge and skills. So although the death of an iron smelting specialist was probably a very dangerous situation, societies actually were rather adaptable and could last a very long time. So Brocksmith, which was my main uh, study site for the PhD, was actually continuously occupied for, for approximately 800 years. We have really good evidence to show that. Um, and I thought it was really interesting, Katrina's paper, who witnessed a kind of similar pattern um, of, of kind of flux and, and uh, dynamic uh, relationships in, in central Portugal. I thought that was really interesting. I'm going to try and play this again, just because there's a little glitch. You'll see a little jump where that big red splodge flips, flip reverses, kind of. Um, and there's the abandonment of one key site here, and that's uh, Chaprain Law. That's arguably because it was a hierarchical, ar hierarchical um, organized microcosm within this network, within this um, area. Um, and you know, it's rather famous for the area because it has a unique concentration of late Bronze Age metalwork in the region. But the site, as I've just said, it wasn't long lasting and it was abandoned. Um, it was then to be reoccupied later, but this is again to do with the uh, kind of late Iron Age Roman shift in power. So that is dynamic and I think issues of scale have come out today and I think I'm, I'm getting at that with this, with this um, reanalysis re of the data. So simple hierarchies seem to be bounded materialities. So these hamper creativity, adaptability, and divergence. 
Heterarchies, on the other hand, are built up messy materialities. So we have to study these diachronically through time. And a heterarchy also, I think, preserves diversity. So it preserves it, it values diversity. Whereas um, the longer a hierarchy manages to survive, the narrower a society's collective know-how becomes and the more prone to patterns of abandonment and catastrophe it is, like Jabrain Law. Crumley argues a very, um, in a similar argument for continental Europe, where she um, looks at how a more reliable, warm, temperate climate encouraged um, people to adopt um, uh, uh, the Roman hierarchical system of access to goods and produce. And this eroded, she argues, Iron Age people's precious understanding of the value of ecological diversity making people increasingly dependent on only a few species and ever more reliant on the exchange of goods from, from the continent. So ultimately, with the collapse of the control centre of Rome, and with the collapse of Rome, society, she argues, was unable to recover as it had lost its safety blanket of diverse know-how and knowledge. So the lesson here is that although hierarchical models are often considered to be the most efficient system for decision making and access to resources, is it worth the risk long term? Heterarchy might be a safer bet. Um, I thought it was interesting, Alex's paper, Alexis's paper, sorry, um, on this topic and how in hierarchy, um, sorry if I, I kind of don't get this quite right, but I think you were saying that a hierarchy um, the, that power system based on the consumption of wealth encourages a more violent type com competition of resources. So it's worth fighting for. But again, it's this uh, stability and instability question of resilience. So how do we move forward? Some of you might recognize this slide and I've, I've really enjoyed all the messiness, um, pictorial representations of heterarchy we've had today so far. This is my favorite. This is um, known as the Opti project. It's an open source project um, attempt to illustrate the complexity of the internet. They call it network mapping. Um, this image is actually now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And since the World Wide Web was gifted to the world by Tim Berners-Lee, um, it has remained open source and ultimately it belongs to no one. It's always in a state of dynamic flux, and its organization evolves by its use through, through everyone. Interestingly, the exchange of data, um, how it is organized, um, it happens to be in the main hierarchical to central hubs nodes, as you can see in this image. Despite the fact that peer-to-peer -peer protocols, so the exchange of data, has um, more kind of um, equal, um, on the other hand, are regarded to be the most stable because once you've set up a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, nobody can ever really shut them down um, and they're decentralized. But as, speed rates, um, sorry, as their speed rates show, um, they're not actually very efficient. So the internet actually is a very heterarchical organization. It has a mixture between hierarchical and peer-to-peer -peer data. <coughs> and therefore, it's adaptable to fast rates of technological development. So I wonder, can we substitute the nodes in this pattern, this image, and the, and the messiness <clears throat> with OPEDA, with settlement patterns, with craft networks? So what if we looked at the, the exchange of cheese or oak? and the making of oak and the use of oak and people's assemblages building around oak powder cheese. What would that look like? Would it look like this? And also, what was the equivalent to the World Wide Web as a heterarchical force in the Iron Age? Was it ritual, as some people today have argued? Was it inheritance? It's, it's interesting. And also, as has been raised, how does it deal with actual experience? Um, since we do experience the world as individuals. And in a heterarchy, we must recognize that these central places, right, this is where technology may fail again, um, central places, nodes of powers, are actually rather c 
collisions and conglomerates of individuals' own experience and beliefs. So to butcher Crumley's words, I do apologize, these relationships between each other actually create social structure. So it's the relationships that are the kind of gel. Yes. So um, I just quite like this image because this is a, an emergent kind of heterarchy in a way. It, it just, uh, this is a live, a live um, tweet of the referendum debate, the Scottish in independence referendum debate, the final one, uh, four days before um, voting. So just to show that it, it is people that, that, and how boundaries and, and uh, become blurred. Um, and indeed, we live in an era where um, familiar structures of society and social relations are increasingly being questioned and redefined. And this is due, again, I'm going back to the internet, which is allowing this immediate sharing of ideas and information. <laughs> um, I think that's what's breaking the internet. Sorry, anyway, I'll carry on, I'll whitter on. Um, so the internet is, is actually redefining our traditionally more rigid social networks. These are being unraveled and rewoven. And social media and televised public debates are one part of this, but more recently, um, uh, recent political events such as Occupy Wall Street or the Arab Spring in, since 2011 have further brought forward to the tensions between formalized economic structures and new emergent liberal global identities and relationships. I'm really sorry I've broken technology, but I don't actually need it, so, well. <coughs> I'll show the final clip in a minute, but I'll just carry on to order. So, um, what was also interesting today was this question of the institution that's come up and where power, kind of the agency of power, where does it reside? Um, and I'm wondering, I don't know um, if this is quite right, but I think the internet actually is anti-institution, or it can be used in that way, and that power is actually in the people, and this subverts the kind of traditional hierarchical model. Um, and in this world of the internet, many more voices can be heard across its democratic platform, allowing arguably for ever greater diversity. So we're actually currently in a constant state of destabling, uh, where toppled, well, well, where more simple hierarchical systems and autocratic power systems across the world, as we see in, in um, the news every night, are being toppled. We are having the forced abdication of kings, new democratic elections, new votes for women in Saudi Arabia, so on. And so this partly, partly is due to new social systems um, enabled through, through um, as many scholars are, are writing about, uh, the internet. Unfortunately though, this is also resulting in civil war, and this isn't really something we've talked explicitly about today because heterarchies are not always harmonious and they're actually usually more arduous. But nevertheless, it's this question of resilience that I think is really important. And it's true that the internet is not going away anytime soon and social media will continue to be a diachronic force for change. And I think this is where we as archaeologists are really important, well, we have a responsibility anyway, is because it's really hard to understand the mess we're currently living in. And therefore, we have a responsibility to, to learn from heterarchies in the past, and we have this benefit of time depth. So, to return to my first question that I highlighted, what interpretive models are useful for understanding this messy experience of the world? <coughs> oh yay! Uh, which one? That one. This is just perfect timing, actually, because well, we can skip over to. So that was just to, yeah. So we got that. Was, that's the kind of most popular hashtags that have um, been used for political debates on Twitter since 2011 up till present day. Um, but actually, I think this, I used this uh, two years ago when I first talked about heterarchies and thought about it. Um, 
It's uh, just a drawing, I think, that represents uh, this idea of what Crumley describes as an emergent society, which is an intricate net of power relationships in which negotiating individuals operate in varying contexts, and these play the critical roles. So she argues we must study these number of relationships and elements and the variety of ways in which they are related to one another. And obviously, as has been mentioned by numerous um, speakers today, this um, alerts us to the idea of Ingold's meshwork, where people's experience of the world are represented as lines and flows, and a mess of lines that are com constantly being re brought into being and redrawn, unraveled, rewoven. And Adrian Chad Chadwick talked this morning about how trackways and enclosures are emergent meshworks. I like that, I thought that was beautiful. And Jonathan Last, again, gave us great examples of in Wiltshire of these reorganization of networks emerging in the landscape and the palimpsest and how they're built up. And Paul, as well, talking about how the material relationships uh, assemble a house. So I think all these make up this kind of mesh. <clears throat> And I think it's a very helpful way to visualize heterarchy. So anyway, I'm going to conclude, I think, and get to discussion, because I think as the session has demonstrated, um, our current dominant interpretive models of social systems are not really up to the job of fully encompassing this idea of heterarchy. But I think we have made headway today. As we've seen, social systems are often visualized as frozen in time and as highly organized. Such visualizations favor interpreting a more simple model of society. But as we've illustrated today, the evidence is actually in different times and places and over time, in reality, far more messy. Um, so Katrina showed that really well. Penny showed that really well. It's, it's great. Um, so to look for um, complex heterarchy, systems and progress our understanding of them through time. We need to cut through, I, I would argue, the kind of multi-dimensional bundle of relationships which make, make up our worlds. So perhaps I'm proposing a kind of fragmentary archaeology. So anyway, I'll end there and I'm going to throw it to discussion. So thanks. <laughs>